Hi, this is Heartstock Radio. I'm your host, Carol Murphy. And just want to say thanks so much for listening. We're pre-recording this program here in beautiful Butte, Montana. And, you know, spring spring is kind of a tease in Montana. It snows and then it'll be, oh, say 70 degrees. So, yeah, we're ready for spring. It is a beautiful, sunshiny day. Our guest this week is speaking with us from Costa Rica. He's Felipe Zalamea of Sumac Travel in just a moment. He's going to be speaking with us, and um, I'm hoping to learn a lot about sustainable travel. We've had guests on previously that have spoken about this, and I'm sure Felipe has a lot to share. Remember that you can find us on Facebook, and you can also email us at heartstockradio at gmail.com. I'm Carol Murphy, your host. Clark Grant is in the studio. In just a moment, we will be back with Felipe Zalamea of Sumac Travel. This is Heartstock Radio, and I'm your host, Carol Murphy. Today, our guest is Felipe Zalamea. He is the founder of Sumac Travel. Hi, Felipe, and thanks so much for sharing your story on Heartstock. Hi, Carol. It's so nice to be here. Thanks so much for having me. What is it like there in Costa Rica, and and where in Costa Rica are you speaking with us from? Uh, Right now is the start of the rainy season. We're like in a transition after the dry season, and... It's a nice moment because because it's refreshing. Uh, we're based in San Jose, the capital city, but we're lucky enough to travel around a lot. Like uh, last week, I was in Nicoya for the whole week, just visiting community-based tourism projects and some producers because we're taking advantage of this pandemic to create more and innovative uh, tours, products. So I can't complain. (laughs) So tell our listeners, what is Sumac Travel? Can you give them a little intro here? Yes, Uh, we are a sustainable tourism platform. We connect conscious travelers with local tour operators in Latin America. The product that we try to promote combines remote destinations with community-based tourism initiatives. This is tourism projects that are led and managed by rural communities, usually farmers, uh, indigenous people, uh, fishermen or artisans, and conventional or traditional tourism destinations like the things that you have to see when you visit uh, a country. Like if you go to Peru, you have to visit Machu Picchu. If you come to Costa Rica, you have to visit the Arnal Volcano. So we create this combination under a social enterprise model. We promote it to travelers that are very interested in culture, in nature, in a better way of interacting with locals and with biodiversity and with destinations. We started 10 years ago in London, England. Uh, For five to six years, we were actually a tour operator. We were uh, creating tailor-made tours for these conscious travelers who wanted to visit Latin America and go off the beaten path, uh, have meaningful and authentic cultural exchanges with uh, communities or with local people. Year five or six, we changed into the current business model. From being a tour operator, we became a sustainable tourism platform because we really want local tour companies to have more control over the product, over the sales process, over the sustainability efforts. So in a way, we were the middleman and we 
always knew that it was temporary and that we are now just a platform that connects conscious travelers with local tour operators that follow our responsible tourism policy and uh, sustainability guidelines. Wow, this really sounds like my idea of travel. You know, before we we delve and dive into all that you just said, because there's so so much more information to share, tell us a little bit about your background. It's very interesting, and I'm sure it has a lot to do with where you find yourself now. What did you do before? Um, I grew up in Colombia, actually. When I was 18 years old, I moved to Europe to study. I finished my master's degree in Paris uh, in economics. And my dream since I was a little boy was to travel across Latin America. Um, As soon as I finished my, my master's degree, I went for one year backpacking across uh, South America. And that's the moment where I discovered community-based tourism because I didn't want to be the, the usual tourist that just goes to the main attractions and has no interactions with local culture. Um, I wanted to go to these remote areas to, to stay with uh, communities in a setting that allows for uh, a meaningful exchange. And I did this for one year and it was wonderful from Argentina to, to Colombia. Like I spent a lot of time in Brazil, Chile, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador. And I fell in love with uh, this type of tourism. So I moved back to, to Europe. I, I went to, to London and I worked for a while, um, in the social enterprise industry, like, at the time, it was something quite new. Today, like we have the big corps and many big companies or cooperatives are implementing this social enterprise model. At the time, it was something quite strange. Like it was difficult for people to understand what's the difference between a social, social enterprise and an NGO. So I was working for a social uh, venture intermediary like a a business who was on the one hand advising entrepreneurs on how to become social entrepreneurs and be investment ready. And on the other hand, working with investors who wanted, who wanted to transition towards impact investment. In other words, they didn't want to invest in um, mainstream industries or companies that were generating a negative impact on the environment or society. They want, they wanted their money to have a positive impact and impact investment was a a great way of, of doing it. So I acquired like this experience. I learned a lot about this model and then I decided to start my own social enterprise, like taking all the contacts and all the micro destinations, these areas that are not touristy, but had a lot of tourism potential. And I put all together as a tour operator into a very well organized offer. Uh, At the time it was quite innovative because very few companies were doing that in the tourism industry. Like today it's more normal. You see big tourism companies promoting community-based tourism And sometimes we even uh, promote the same destinations, which can be good because they're bringing tourists into communities that really need or welcome these opportunities. Uh, But at the same time, they're like transferring some of the bad practices from the mass tourism industry into these uh, rural communities. But that will be another another topic for another interview. (laughs) And... Like six, yeah, six years ago, more or less at the same time that we transitioned into the platform model, I moved to Costa Rica. Like it didn't make a lot of sense to to be in Europe. Uh, It is very expensive. At the time, it was already possible to do everything online. 
for us, it was better to be in Latin America. And as you may know, Costa Rica is very well known for its ecotourism initiatives, uh, its sustainability efforts. So it was the right choice. You mentioned that when you went on your year-long backpacking extravaganza, that you you fell in love and you had very meaningful exchanges in your your experiences. Can you share a little bit about that? You know, why were they they meaningful and and why is it so important that we all have these kinds of experiences if if and when possible? Yeah. Um, I'm going to take an example to show how meaningful and how important it can be. I was in Bolivia, in the Sun Island, in Lake Titicaca. From a landscape point of view, it's really stunning. Like, it's beautiful. If you like nature, like, this is a destination that would be a must for, for you. Most tourists just see this aspect, like a beautiful lake, the Andes, maybe they go to market to try some local food, and that's it. What I did when I was in San Island was to stay with an indigenous community in the island, and I spent five days with them, like literally sharing their house we were having meals together. We would go on hikes in the island with them. We would go on boat rides in their, in their canoes, in their, in their traditional boat with no other tourists. Like I was the only foreign person there. So you can imagine the level of intimacy, the, the opportunity to be there sharing their food, listening to their stories, uh, learning more about their culture the relationship with land, with food, with the lake. This is something that most tourists don't see or hear about because they just go from one tourism attraction to the other one. I had lots of experiences like this one in Patagonia, in the south of Chile, across Brazil. And uh, I know but it's not for everyone. Like not everyone dreams of having this kind of cultural exchanges when on vacation. But I know that there are some travelers that really look for this kind of experiences. So this is what we try to put forward when we promote a destination. What did you learn from their culture and from spending those five days elbow to elbow with them? They have a strong relationship with Mother Earth. And this might sound trite, but that's the reality. Um, what we call development uh, for them is when we vivir, the good living. So they don't have the same values, the same way of approaching life or businesses or relationships. Uh, they try to, to find this harmony, this peaceful way of interacting with the earth, with the animals, with other people. Um, it makes you question a lot of our own lifestyle and the values that, that we have in, in Latin America or in the US or Europe. So it's very interesting to see this contrast, to be able to learn more about their lifestyle, their cosmovision and traditions. I love food. So the food aspect was also very important while I was traveling. And when I have customers that love food too, like they get to try traditional dishes prepared at home. And for me, that's uh, an incredibly value adding experience. Then if you want to, to talk about spirituality, if you are into ancestral wisdom, it is also a great opportunity to, to exchange, to, to take part in rituals. And I'm, I'm not talking about like people dancing, wearing what they call traditional costumes. I'm talking about really intimate ceremonies where you have the opportunity to open up and to absorb 
of this ancestral knowledge. And I could give you more examples of, of how these experiences can, can be uh, meaningful, but Latin America has a lot of cultures. I think it's a, it's a beautiful mix. We can talk about indigenous people from Chile and they're going to be very different to those from Bolivia or Colombia. Then we have a lot of Afro-descendant communities. Uh, we have farmers. This also makes it uh, really attractive for someone who is interested in, in culture. Yes, I'm just chomping at the bit here, so to speak, as we as we say in Montana. <laughs> We're going to take our quick midpoint break here. And in just a moment, we will be back with Felipe of Sumac Travel. This is Heartstock. You're listening to Heartstock Radio. I'm Carol Murphy, your host, and we've been speaking with Felipe, and this is where my <laughs> my honky roots kind of slay me. Felipe Zalamea. It's a beautiful name, and I did not want to mess it up. <laughs> So, Felipe, we were just talking about the cultural immersions that folks can experience. Let's talk about sustainability and why is it so important and why are you kind of, it sounds like almost emphasizing cultural exchanges with Indigenous folks. How does that tie into your mission of sustainability and sustainable travel? So, since we started, like sustainability was our core business. It is our core business today. The main motivations to, to create and to grow this business were to empower rural communities through tourism. So they have this additional income and more opportunities to be able to improve their standards of living, to protect their ecosystems, to preserve their culture. And at the same time, we wanted to use business to generate positive impact on destinations. Those were the main goals when, when creating the company. And it is still is our, our mission today. Rather than worrying about plastic or recycling, or these things that are really important about sustainability but that don't involve or don't push us to, to have structural changes. Since the very beginning, we wanted to take a holistic approach. Like we want the sustainability not to be about recycling paper in the office, like some businesses try to, to show or, or to or to market as a sustainability effort. But we really wanted to create positive impact on four dimensions. We wanted to create jobs and income for rural communities. We wanted to support conservation efforts to make sure that they all have the necessary means or tools to protect their forests, their lakes, their land. We wanted tourism to be this catalyzer so their culture is more valued, not only by tourists or by governments, but by the communities themselves. We have seen that there is a huge impact when they have visitors that really appreciate their culture. We're talking about communities that have suffered from exclusion, from discrimination for many, many years. We could talk about problems with self-esteem and many of the young people in these communities are migrating to, to the main cities in their countries. So through tourism, there is a process of cultural revalorization, like they see 
through the eyes of visitors that their culture has actually a lot to offer, a lot of richness in it. We could also talk about gender equality, like in the vast majority of projects, community-led projects that we work with, women have leadership positions. Some of them are actually women-led, and that's why they were born. We see also a change where before women had very limited roles in the rural economy, because most of the time, like you have to farm or to fish or to create handicrafts. With tourism, like women can also become entrepreneurs and have their own income. We would talk about this cultural aspect as well, like the gender equality that these projects are promoting. So what I want to say is when we wrote down our responsible tourism policy, we went dimension by dimension. Uh, the fourth dimension was the social dimension, which is about creating more opportunities, equality, improving the living standards of, of population. So we put together like these four dimensions into a responsible tourism policy, which includes ways how to operate a tourism business or a tourism activity. Like we have to pay fair prices. We have to use sustainable inputs, materials. We have to build a lot in a way that respects the environment and also how to communicate or to create awareness with tourists because they also need some guidelines or at least recommendations on how to be a responsible traveler because you can have good intentions, but something that you're doing or buying is having a, a negative impact on destination or on the local communities that you're visiting. So this responsible tourism policy that includes all four dimensions, it's aimed at improving operations and tourist behaviors is like the most important tool for our sustainability efforts. When we transitioned towards the platform model, within the contract that we signed with each one of our local partners, we have only one partner per country. And currently we have 16 partners. So we have 16 tourism businesses that are following this responsible tourism policy when they create products, when they operate products, when they host travelers in their destinations. Apart from that, we're trying to get the most of the sustainable tourism movement. Like when we started, we were a few companies like promoting sustainability in the tourism industry. And actually, there were very few social enterprises in the tourism industry. Today is a whole different story. And lots of things are happening that are positive for the industry. And we have big stakeholders that are looking more towards a holistic sustainability approach, which is great. So we try to, to be part of that movement. And whenever they come up with a manual or with a campaign, or with tools that we can share with our network, like we do it. To give you an example, we are part of the global community-based tourism network. So we work with NGOs, universities, and some other stakeholders that are promoting community-based tourism, not only in Latin America, but across the world. We're also members of the World Indigenous Tourism Alliance, which is a network of tourism businesses and other stakeholders that are trying to uh, improve the way uh, indigenous tourism is developed and promoted. And I'm also wondering what lays ahead. We have oh about three minutes left here. You know, and it, th this really ties into the question about COVID. And we're all just really desiring to get back to our travels. What is ahead for you? As we do tailor-made tourism, like it's highly personalized, is the opposite of mass tourism. 
like it's looking promising. And actually the last couple of months we've been very busy because those travelers that before were happy to go on a cruise or to join a big group, like 30 or more people visiting a country, they don't want to do that anymore. They're looking for something more private, for something where they're not in crowds, where they go off the beaten path. So I think our model and our product is ideal for a post-pandemic scenario. As the impact of, of COVID has been so drastic across the globe, especially on mental health and well-being, we are now promoting wellness tourism. It's not something new. It's something that's been around for a while. But Apart from these cultural and natural experiences that we normally offer, we're also starting to include wellness activities. Like you could think of meditation of, or mindfulness, but we also want to create these workshops or activities where being in contact with nature, with culture, you can actually improve your mental health. And in a very modest way, try to recover from the impacts of the pandemic. This December, we're running a wellness retreat here in Costa Rica. It's an eight-day experience where we combine uh, one-to-one sessions with meditation, with workshops, with tourism activities. Like you would go well watching in the morning and then in the afternoon, you would have a positive leadership workshop or an art therapy workshop we plan to do a couple of these per year like next year we are already working in peru and in guatemala to also connect with this indigenous tourism aspect because we strongly believe that this ancestral wisdom needs to be recovered needs to be recognized as something important for a post-pandemic world Mm. like maybe there's some change of mindset where as people we start seeing things in a different way focusing more on sustainability or a better lifestyle yeah Mm. beyond sustainability it's it's more about the lifestyle and having this is this better way of interacting with others uh, with nature. Yeah, a lot to learn. Can you share with our listeners how they can find you, Felipe? So we have a, a website. It's sumac-travel.org, S-U-N-A-K-travel.org. And we're also on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, Sumac Travel. You can find us. Oh, gosh. I might show up on your doorstep. (laughs) I'll I'll try and give you some warning. Hey, I'm on my way. (laughs) Please do. Um, We'd be happy to to help. (laughs) (laughs) This is hard stock. And who knows, maybe uh, uh, not tomorrow or next week, but who knows, maybe I'll be joining you from from Costa Rica in, in the near future. But we will definitely be back next week, as always. Yeah, definitely uh, get in touch and we will be happy to help. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. We'll be back next week. Peace. Heartstock Radio is a production of KBMF 102.5 Butte America Radio. Hear our programs every Friday at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time via live stream at butteamericaradio.org.